якщо ж підключиться наша Доброго дня. Так, доброго дня. І по часу лекція там хвилин 40, а потім 20 хвилин на, на запитання, чи як? Чи всі, всю годину лекції? Ну, я думаю, запитаннями так. Запитання. Ну і так, щоб у нас якась перерва залишилась перед дискусією. Доброго дня. Доброго дня. Добрий день. Hi, I'm also joined. Yes, so I'm online. Okay, I'm joined. Thank you. Окей, okay, а то значить, я англійською мовою, так, окей. Так, так, Це всі фонці чують, чи тільки я? А вас чути, Юрій Володимирович, а ви, може, там напишіть, хто ви є, щоб було? А я не знаю, як його писати. Ну, добре. Хай буде, бо це буде довго. Ага, добре. Там три крапочки над, вашою, над вашим відео є, і там внизу опція перейменувати, рінейм. Так, бо рінейм. А, бачу, бачу. Так. Три крапочки над вашим відео є. Там внизу опція перейменувати. Так, вони на її. А, бачу, бачу. Так, може, мабуть. Я думаю, що над вашим вікном є. Там внизу у кухні я перейменував. Так, може, мабуть. Я думаю, що над вашим вікном є. Там внизу у кухні я перейменував. Тільки у мене фонить, чи? Ні, фонить, зараз я це. Може, може. Ну, секунду, я зараз... Так, так, так. Тільки у мене фонить, чи? Ні, фонить, зараз я це.
А, за... а зараз слухайте, нормально, ні? Зараз добре. Так, ну, да, це я вийду, вибачте мене. Це в мене перелом на ютубі. Да, вибачте, Антон, да, да, дякую. Ну, ми можемо починати, чи що тоді, да? так? Добре, значить, шановні друзі, колеги, радий вас вітати на другій уже. Ми дожили до другої конференції Товариства дослідників 18 століття. На жаль, конференція відбудеться онлайн, хоча ми всі надіялися, що вона буде офлайн, але обставини, і зараз ви бачите, ну, навпаки, воно посилюється щось тимчасово, надіємося, але <кій> так, так склалося, що конфер... вже друга, ми фактично з часу заснування живемо в онлайні, і для того, щоб зустрітися і нормально поговорити, нам довелося виїжджати до Риму на конференцію. <кій> Але все одно товариство, попри всі ці обставини, товариство діє і конференція принаймні організована. Я сподіваюся, що вона буде, да, ну, ми відпрацюємо так же нормально і так же добре, як і минулого разу, коли була перша конференція. І так само у нас будуть добрі доповіді, плідні дискусії. Ну і можливо якісь, і, і надію, що це стане початком якихось нових проєктів, нових ідей. Ну і е, е, принаймні, е, хоча б в онлайні, ми зустрінемося, поговоримо, поспілкуємося, обговоримо е, доповіді один одного. І таким чином можна говорити, що по-перше живе товариство, по-друге про те, що взагалі... Е, не, не вмирають дослідження 18 століття, і попри війну ми працюємо і, і, і робимо якийсь продукт. Я щиро радий вас вітати, запрошую до подальших дискусій і, і бажаю до її доповідей, і бажаю, щоб ця конференція для вас склалася як можна краще, щоб враження від неї були добрими і відповідно, може зав'язуються якісь нові контакти, ну і все, що дає конференція. На жаль, кулуарів тут ми можемо хіба що, ну, може хтось десь є в одному місці ходити там на каву. Будемо кавувати онлайн. Ну, але Вкладемо більш приємні зустрічі до такі, завершення війни. Ну і бажаю вас, закликаю до праці, що можна ще сказати, і, і плідної праці, і гарних вражень, і гарного настрою ці три дні. Е, вони насичені, ви бачили, програмою. Можна відвідувати різні секції, можна брати в них участь в дискусіях і так далі. Тому я від імені товариства вас вітаю, бажаю всього найкращого, гарної роботи. І закликаю до роботи така тут місія. Прошу, Френко. Yes, uh, I just was at Columbia University and there was an exhibit from the Berkholtz collection uh, of uh, 18th century paintings, copies of 18th century paintings. It was called Ukraine's People Revealed. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, series of reproductions of the paintings maintained in Sweden from the 1740s. Uh, but uh, I think that title, Ukraine's People Revealed, Early 18th Century Paintings of Ukrainian Society, in a way tells us uh, what uh, successes and what has been done in 18th century studies in the West in the past decade, largely because of your work. I might add there was a display case in which uh, prominently displayed was our 18th century uh, Ukraine, uh, the series of essays in which many of you participated, available in English, and as well, uh, the new edition of the Velichko Chronicle, uh, obviously, uh, a book of tremendous weight, both physically, 
but also for Ukrainian studies. Um, and so when I looked at that, and it drew large numbers of people uh, who uh, examined it, I thought of the many topics uh, that we've dealt with. Uh, one, the coming together of what might be called uh, studies in Ukraine and studies from the diaspora that in many ways occurred in the late 1980s and early 1990s and return of 18th century studies to Ukraine, particularly from a whole generation that created them abroad. Uh, and this certainly laid a foundation for the field. If that first decade, as we describe in the introduction to our volume, was largely what might be called freeing from Russian imperial and Soviet shackles, the return of political history, the ability to publish sources, uh, the ability to look on what had been forbidden topics in Ukrainian history and coming out from under uh, the repressions that occurred, particularly in the 19, 19, after 1972. Really, the first decade of the 20th century was uh, a time when Ukrainian uh, scholarship accepted and embraced many of the tendencies that it saw in international studies, whether they be the turn for the empire or new kinds of social and cultural history. And I think that the volume that we put out in many ways represented those changes, not fully, and of course much more could have gone into the volume, but it represented changes that occurred up until the year 2020. And I think a great growth in the field of 18th century studies that was not fully appreciated even by scholars in Ukraine, I think, and certainly by those outside. Uh, after uh, the appearance of this volume and the full-scale Russian invasion, we face a very different intellectual climate. Uh, and in many ways, uh, uh, topics uh, that would have been looked at differently such as empire, colonization, the type of empire that the Russian empire was, uh, the existence of Ukrainian cultural identity and its roots and its difficulties, now will be looked at, I think, uh, inevitably. Each generation looks from its own perspective back in time. And I see that in much of the conference that we have put out. But above all, I think what, what you all should be very proud of is the degree to which uh, you have kept the field going in these extremely difficult times, as you are dispersed, as many of us are cut off. Uh, some of us were always cut off from uh, Leningrad, Moscow, St. Petersburg. Uh, some of you have been recently cut off from source materials that, that, we, would, that we would like to study. And all of these will affect the work on the 18th century, uh, as will the breakdown of dialogue inevitable at a time of war, of a genocidal war being conducted. But on the other hand, it has offered new opportunities, opportunities above all of extending research in archival and library sources outside of Ukraine and Russia and the former Soviet Union. But I think the most important uh, development has been your ability to found the 18th Century Association in Ukraine, to conduct the first conference, and the wonderful uh, embrace, acceptance, and support which the Ukrainian Association has gained from the International Association. Uh, your great successes in Rome, uh, in which uh, Ukrainian studies and Ukraine have never been so well represented and presented before the international community. And now the second conference, uh, which leads us to new topics we will be discussing over these days, beginning with a initial session on the, prob on the issues of decolonizing the field and how that relates to the study of 18th century Ukraine. And above all, uh, Ukraine's full membership in the International As Association, just as Ukraine uh, searches for full recognition 
uh, and membership in the European community and in NATO as a way to have Ukraine and its intellectual inheritance fully integrated into the European and a greater international community. So I wish you all lively discussions and a successful conference. And in the name of the Peter Yatsik Center for Ukrainian Historical Research, Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, University of Alberta, uh, we are grateful for all you do and grateful that you give us at times the opportunity to support some of your endeavors for which we are uh, as well owe a debt of gratitude uh, to the donors of the Institute and the funds which have made possible uh, the the limited support we have been able to give you. So I wish you all a lively uh, and an interesting conference. Thank you. Дякую, Френку. Ну, можна говорити, вважати, що конференція почалася, да? і, очевидно, можемо переходити до, до чи будемо чекати перерву робити. Перейдемо зразу, можемо переходити до кіно. Прошу, Катя. А... Uh, hello, I'm, uh, today I have honor to present our keynote lecture. Um, uh, it's um, um, our friend and colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Satapa Duta. Uh, she's a professor of English uh, at Gargi College, University of Delhi. Uh, her research interests and publications are uh, focused on 18th and 19th century writings uh, and and uh, cover gender, education, and identity in uh, colonial, uh, colonial India Raj. Um, she's a fellow of the Royal uh, Historical Society, uh, London, and uh, formerly uh, she was a fellow at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies. Uh, Dr. Duda has authored uh, as uh, editor British Women Missionaries uh, in Bengal, uh, 1793, 1861, uh, British Women Travelers, um, Empire and Beyond, 1787, um, uh, published in uh, 2017. Uh, and as uh, co-editor, Mapping India, uh, Transitions and Transformations, 18th, 19th century, uh, published in 2020. Her latest book, uh, also published in 2020, um, is uh, Discipline Subjects, uh, Schooling in Colonial Bengal. And today she will uh, give a lecture on imperial identity in British India and its satirical representations. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Katerina. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, congratulations to the Ukraine Society for organizing this conference, despite so many odds, despite the pol political turbulence. And I'm really, really grateful to the organizers, and especially Natalia Voloshkova, for having invited me at this forum. Uh, to Dr. Yuri Voloshin, I'm very grateful for this opportunity that's been given to me uh, to talk on a topic which is very, very close to my heart on rethinking empire and colonialism. Uh, and I will today, of course, speak uh, in the context of India. Okay, and in the 18th and the 19th century, India, as we know, was occupied by the British. Uh, it was colonized by the British East India Company. So I'll I'll share my PPT, uh, and uh, please let me know if if it is visible. Um, okay, just a second. Let me just. Yes, we can see it. Yes, you can see it. Okay, one second. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, is it full screen now? Is it visible? Yeah, thank you. So, um, the title, as you can see, is Imperial Identity in British India and its Satirical Representation. Uh, so uh, this is during the 18th and the 19th century uh, when the British occupied India. 
And I'm looking particularly at this region, okay, at this region here, uh, which is Bengal. Okay, this is India, and I'm looking at the eastern side of India, uh, which is called Bengal. Uh, this is where I, the, my, the study is going to be focused on this. So um, the colonial experience had resulted in an anxiousness among the Indians, especially the elite Indians, as to how would they define themselves as a social class? How would they um, indicate or delineate their gentility? How would they shape a new code of acceptability by the colonizers? So I'm looking at Bengal today to see how the shifting markers of gentility and how uh, the entire identity of the Bengalis emerged at this period of time when their identity was in a way being challenged by the British. So I look at a typical, um, um, you know, uh, uh, it's called Bengali Babu. They were called Bengali Babus. So the Babu word and his wife, Bibi, what did it denote? Okay. So, and who were they? So the Bengali Babu, it's B-A-B-U or B-A-B-O-O, was a social class, okay? Uh, and this was the elite uh, upper class, uh, and it was thanks to the trade and enterprise in British India <clears throat> that this class, uh, they became very rich. So they were Bengali merchants, uh, typically, and they formed an important trading community, played prominent role either as intermediaries uh, for as foreign merchants, but uh, they usually had joint business ventures with the European partners. So uh, the first generation of such indigenous merchants who made their fortunes through collaborations with the British were called the Babus, the Bengali Babus. So the wealth, the entire trade of Bengal was practically concentrated in their hands and they managed the estates, they ran banks, they ran the insurance companies, the shipping companies, the trading houses. So these Babus, the word Babu was a, honorific uh, title and honor that was given to these officials, sometimes by Queen Victoria herself. So it signified a wealthy class of Bengali gentlemen who belonged to a very influential families. And uh, together, you know, this prefix Babu and the name uh, it was an acknowledgement of the wealth, of the standing in society. Uh, who had who established the economic and the political base of British India. Uh, now, what came to be termed as Babu culture was an ostentatious display of wealth. So they were the newly rich, uh, newly rich. So some of the families, uh, they, uh, as I would just show here, uh, this is Babu Rajendra Malik's marble palace in Calcutta. As you can see from the, the architecture here, uh, it is, it has, uh, it's replicating uh, almost European architecture, the colonnades there, the pillars, okay, uh, right? And this is what it looks like. So this is Babu Rajendra Malik's palace in Calcutta, it still exists. So they were the upwardly mobile fortune makers and they imitated the Western architectural styles as is evidenced from their, uh, the entrances, the pillars there, the marble flooring, and then of course the new statues, the, the fountains inside. Okay. So, and these Babus were, they had, they owned huge mansions, huge palaces, and they had very whimsical styles, whimsical living uh, styles. So they would wear the best of clothes, you know, they would um, have weird tastes like keeping pet rhinoceroses at home. They played the piano uh, and they learned Western art and literature. They had dance parties, banquets, they kept mistresses. Okay. So they had lavish lifestyle. Uh, so they were a curious hybrid, okay? Uh, Indian by birth, right? Bengalis by taste, but trying to imitate the Western lifestyle. Now in the speech, in the deportment, in the dress, in the style, in the housing, in the eating habits, all of this was fundamentally they're trying to imitate the Western uh, uh, Englishmen. So uh, 
it's very difficult to actually capture this category of the Babu because of the ambivalence of the meaning. It oscillated between a social category. Sometimes it was a self-designated category. Sometimes it was an honor or a stereotype. And often it was a label for ridicule and abuse. Okay? So while the term Babu could be used as a, um, as a term, as a title of honor and respect, it could also be used as a derogatory term to sarcastically denote the foppishness okay, uh, of the Western educated Calcutta based Bengalis. Now, with this infiltration of English education uh, and Western ideas into the Bengali households, many of these uh, elite Bengali households started sending their sons abroad for higher education. And when they came back, they never fully assimilated with the Bengali population, right? Uh, because they had uh, had about uh, eight, eight, 10 or 12 years of English education, either at Oxford or Cambridge. And then they would come back to India and Calcutta. And there they would find it very difficult to uh, assimilate with the Indian masses. So they remained alienated. They were never fully assimilated, either in England or at home. And this absurd mixture of imperial culture and indigenous traditions were satirized. So the Babu prototype uh, came to be satirized. Now, this is uh, the London Shari uh, Shivari, uh, uh, the punch a very well-known magazine which satirized uh, uh, all these imperial uh, you know, uh, things that were happening. And this also started um, uh, the, this uh, criticizing the Babu. Okay? So uh, when these English educated Babus, they began to travel to England for higher studies and they came back, they were seen as social climbers. And the British punch uh, the London Shivari, which is which is called Punch, uh, which started from 1841, this regularly published cartoons on India and the Raj. So um, it was founded, as you know, in 1841, and uh, this was uh, a copy of the satirical magazine, the French satirical magazine, La Shivari. So it was a mean of, means of naming and shaming, uh, of ridiculing uh, the, the, what was happening in that period of time. Okay. Now, um, Punch regularly featured imperial politics and caricatured colonial India. A favorite subject amongst them was the English equivalent of the British gentleman. So this is a comic portrayal of the Bengali Babu whose name is Babu Hari Bangsho Jabarji. It's a big name, deliberately given. And this was published first in Punch. Uh, as a, and uh, what the impression of the Babu here is that he is, um, is, is ridiculed. Okay? Uh, he, the Babu, as you can see in this figure here, uh, is, is very awkward looking. It's a burlesque the ambitious native who has presented himself as a pompous fool. He's overconfident about himself, about his language, about his English. And uh, it, was a, it was a scathing satire on the mongrel status of Indians, okay, who aspire to Britishness. So Babu Jabaji, he is Babu Jabaji, and he is uh, he's hoping uh, that his English education would enable him to be assimilated in the uh, British community. But his otherness, uh, you know, uh, he is what makes him uh, something to be ridiculed. Hmm? So he becomes the subject of ridicule, contempt, and alienation. He becomes at once the comedian and the comic. Now, uh, so the British magazine Punch was instrumental in introducing caricature in India. Punch was already very familiar, or was already very popular among the Indian educated class. And uh, of course, the readership comprised of the middle class Indians who had had an English education. They were familiar with Britain and British India. 
So with uh, um, so the Asian punches, huh? some of the punches which were um, uh, a whole lot of magazines which were inspired by the punch in India, as you can see it on the screen. Uh, this was the Awad punch, the Awad punch. Okay, and th then there was Delhi punch, Urdu punch, Gujarati punch. Punjabi punch, okay, or every region from India started, had their own spin-offs. They were usually owned and edited by British people in India, but there were some, like as I will show in the next few slides, which were run by Indians too. Okay. So the first um, colonial version of the English punch was the Delhi sketchbook. Uh, and uh, this started being published from 1857 onwards. It was essentially meant to uh, uh, be a sketchbook of British social life in the colony, but it poked um, uh, fun at the natives' body, their names, and their inability to comprehend English customs. As you can see here uh, in, in this figure, yeah, image here, uh, this Navad, this Nawab, this Nawab uh, fails to understand English customs and of course thinks that this is a notch party hmm, uh, meant for entertaining him. So the, the, as you can see his body, his, uh, his language, uh, everything is uh, being satirized here. Then um, this is a figure of a young man in a tailcoat, trousers, top hat, and carrying a stick. Uh, he's in bearing an attire, a perfect copy of the English sahibs. But it's, as the cartoon illustrates, it's only by his application to book learning. He has a book, as you can see, tucked under his arm here and one that he's reading. And it is only through this that he can obtain a civil appointment. So that was a pun on the word civil. Uh, civil meaning a well-dressed, enlightened gentleman, and also someone who entered to who who was seeking to enter the civil services. Uh, the civil services was a common aspiration for amongst Indians. So. Um, the British Empire therefore provided a phenomenal popularity. Uh, uh, the sponge became very, very popular. So now the Indian Shivari uh, was being published from Calcutta, but um, uh, it was uh, this is what uh, the young Bengali Babu of the future, the Indian Shivari, uh, caricatured the Bengali Babu as. So he wears a dhoti, which is a traditional Indian cloth, but on top, as you can see, he wears a coat uh, and he has a hat. He has a, he wears a monocle and he's wearing a, an umbrella. Okay, an umbrella and a monocle were symbols of imperialism, a hat especially. Okay? So uh, uh, the oriental behavior, the, the magazine lampoons the, um, those who pretend to be British, okay? who, uh, so they're presented as a cartoon figure, a ridiculous fusion of East and West. So the cigar, cigar, the hat, the mono monocle, these are all Western uh, concepts of the Babu. Now the pictorial mockery mm, of the Babu's physique was often accompanied by an uh, appropriate uh, you know, verse or dodgeral. So this is again from the Indian Shivari. Uh, there was a Babu of Calcutta who lived upon clarified butter till he grew as obese as cramped Strasbourg's geese, this ghee-fed ghee -fed Babu of Calcutta. So what had begun as a very gentle mockery of Anglo-Indian lifestyle soon turned into an exercise that smacked off racism, this one. Okay, it smacked of racism now. So it was no longer a gentle ridicule, a gentle satire. Now this, uh, the punch okay, and the uh, Indian sh uh, sh uh, Shabari, it's uh, the, um, the portrayal of the Bengali Babu smacked of racism and an anti-Indian attitude. So it started depicting a stereotyped Bengali Babu as an ape-like figure. 
uh, and it is, is to be shown his position if he tried to copy the British lion. Okay, so this is the British lion. This is the Indian babu. Okay, and if he tried to copy the lion, he would get eaten. So the Bengali babu was now equated with primates, with apes in physical appearance, and this one. Okay, so this is a zoo. This is a little English girl with her mother and father. She's gone to the zoo and she sees the Bengali babu and the ape who the, they look the same. So the Bengali babu was equated with primates, with apes in physical appearance, and by corollary, therefore, with unresolved, unevolved uh, cognitive capacity. Mm -hmm. So mm, the spread of education among Indians and the social aspiration were frequently being satirized. So uh, this is the enlightened Bengali Babu, the educated Bengali Babu. He's presented as a drunken reprobate, is whiling away his time, is a rubbish of the society, rubbish to be shot here. Okay, this is what's written here on the wall. Our enlightened and educated Babu. So uh, this is a satire, a mocking of those who are educated. Sometimes the educated um, uh, Babu was represented as a modern Lord Krishna. As you can see, is a, is a god, god Krishna here. And uh, he is attired in formal academic regalia, complete with gown and caps and shoes. So, and Krishna is surrounded by women. And because I see here the globe, the books, everything lying here. So the educated male uh, the, who are attempting to emanci uh, emancipate their women by educated, educating them, that too was being uh, ridiculed. Now, how did the Bengalis, this was what was being represented by the English. Okay, the English, how the English, this was how the English represented the Bengali Babu. Now, how were the Bengalis representing themselves? Were they satirizing themselves? Were they using the same stereotype? Were they using the same picture for themselves? So, in Bengal, the educated Bengalis took full advantage of their English learning and they adapted it to their local milieu and they brought out their own vernacular version of punch. So this is the Bengali punch. Um, the, this is Basantak. Basantak is the, uh, the earliest first Bengali punch. It came out in 1873. Uh, and this was brought out by two upper class Bengali elite um, men. Okay. So the, uh, the incarnation of Mr. Punch on the covers of Basantak, as you can see, is of a well-fed Brahmin Pandit. Okay? He's clearly become fat on the superstition around him, on the chaos that is all around him. And all around him is a scene of a filthy and depraved city. So um, this magazine overall had the courage to criticize the British rule. But as you can see, most of the satire as uh, was depicted, uh, most of the satire was visibly aimed at the English educated natives. So the magazine mocked the westernized Bengali Babu uh, and was often depicted as a farcical cartoon. Again here, it is seen as a farcical cartoon uh, and everyone's la laughing and tittering at him, okay? his own people, all right? his own family, everyone's laughing at him. Uh, and the most vitriolic satire uh, was uh, for the newly educated Bengali women. So not just the men who had adapted and adopted uh, the English ways, but also for the Bengali women, uh, those who had become educated, who had become liberated. It was supposed that they had forgotten their traditional and feminine roles. So there was a clear resentment towards modern women. So the magazine lampooned the fashionably dressed Indian housewife. And as you can see, she's depicted reading a novel. Okay, she's an educated woman, a modern woman, and she's reading a novel here. And her husband's cooking. He, this is the pot and he's trying to light the fire. 
is stoking the kitchen fire. So the illustrations here indicates the drawbacks okay, of having an educated modern wife. She imperiously orders the husband, close the door. Okay, she says, close the door because the smoke is irritating my eyes. Hmm. So such cartoons drew on the Bengali men's insecurity that educated women would ignore their hearth and husband. If they would ignore the family. So this was the insecurity that Bengali men felt. So um, again, there was a brilliant uh, comment sometimes on the contemporary society. Uh, and those Bengalis who blindly aped the English ways. So the sale of tails, tails which men, the men wore in the suit, okay, uh, th it was supposed that this, this would gain them respect in society. Okay? So they were, uh, such men were deeply depreciated uh, and um, satirized in the writings of that particular period of time. Okay. Now, so the critical representation of the Babu in which the British native and colonial publications were all in conversation was fascinating in its brilliant depiction of the changes uh, which were taking place at the time. Uh, it was not limited to just visual cartoons alone. There were a number of other literary works, both by Englishmen and Indians, who presented a witty expose of Anglo-Indian social life and manners to either afford amusement or to ridicule the aspirants. So educated urban Indians produced self-depreciatory caricature in the form of novels, in the form of satirical essays and articles that lampooned the Babu. It presented a very powerful portrayal of contemporary colonial Calcutta society. And these writings were clearly disapproving of the rising vulgarity of the newly rich, and people were baffled by this chaotic and unprecedented avenues of social mobility and quick money. At the same time, there were some very pertinent questions which were being asked and attacks were being made on the pretentious facade of colonial subjects and especially by those who were not so well off, who had a marginal position in the colonial discourse. And um, uh, so uh, in many ways, it was not just the educated men, the rich men, uh, the, those who emulated or copied or mimicked the Englishmen who were the target of attack, but also their educated babies, educated wives, who wasted their time and money. It was supposed to be, it was, it was seen as a waste of time and money imitating Western ways. So women's emancipation posed a, a threat to, in a way to the Indian society and it posited a brilliant satire of role reversal uh, or a gender reversal in the, which the husband was subdu subdued and subjected by his independent wife. Okay. So uh, the women in many times where the educated woman uh, was either seen as living a very colorful life, either drinking or making merry with her friends. Now, um, as I said, sometimes it was the indigenous lower classes, the lower orders who found an alternate voice, which was in sharp variance to the rigid and unaccommodating morality of the Victorian society. So uh, there was a, uh, I'll just show you a few of the Kaligat paintings. Hmm? This is Kaligat paintings, where it shows the image of the Bibi, the modern uh, woman, okay, the modern educated woman. Kaligat, this word Kaligat, Kali is the goddess, Ghat is the place where these paintings were made. So near a temple, it, it uh, reflected contemporary social criticism of the Babu and his wife. So uh, this is how it, is, it was perceived, okay? That the woman, she's a wife, okay? On the shoulders of the husband and the poor mother is being dragged behind. And that means he just, um, you know, the man uh, gives in to the whims and fancies of his wife, okay? This is another one 
another painting, Kali Ghat painting, a very well-known painting where the woman who is liberated, educated, modern, uh, beats the husband with a broomstick. Okay. So again, here, she. this is a very uh, anglicized woman, as you can see from the shoes that she wears, okay? Uh, and she's obviously a mistress because of the rose that she holds in her hand. And the man is praying for this mistress's favor. Okay. So um, these were, yeah, so, sorry, these were, these are some of the pictures uh, which shows the, the vibrant folk culture of that time, the paintings, the folk culture, and comprised of a verbal, visual, written manifestations. Uh, it was not just the paintings, but also the songs of the time, the dramatic performances of the time, rituals and writings in 18th, 19th century Bengal. So what these writings, what these uh, paintings, this, um, you know, this folk culture did was uh, that it served as a means for observing contemporary events and commenting on the new colonial order. It contributed to drawing a critical picture of imperial policies and the distortions in the system and the vulnerability of the subjects. So uh, in what may come across as a very classic uh, Spivakian dilemma, it was the brown sahibs, in fact, the behind the magazines, the Indian men behind the magazines were mostly upper class. Uh, they were educated English natives who were both the subject and the object of ridicule. So uh, the Indian magazines, which had an independent voice, it ridiculed and promoted in a way, ridiculed as well as promoted baboonness. So it was very ironic that the Western educated Indian intelligentsia used a Western inspired magazine to lampoon their own selves, while at the same time defining parameters that would set them apart from the masses. So their self mockery was as much an awareness of their social inferiority and unacceptability as of the pathetic ridiculousness in trying to be accepted uh, in the world of the white rulers. So the mimicry was, uh, of course, had disturbing effects as it tried to bridge the gap between the absolute and the imagined differences. Okay, So uh, the jibes at the Bengali Babu, at his effeminacy, at his pretentiousness and mannerisms were therefore by extension directed at the Bengaliness of the community. So one of the effects of colonial modernity was this Bengaliness of the community. So indirectly, while they were self-critiquing themselves, it helped to build a sense of oneness, a feeling of community, a feeling of what it was to be a Bengali. So, and they, this ended up uh, in, carving out a very unique identity for the Bengalis during the imperial rule. Thank you. I think I've done it before time, is it, Katerina? Yeah, it's over. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. And we have plenty of time for discussion and for questions. Um, so. Yes, please, uh, Mr. Sisson. Yes. Okay, I wonder if you could help us by uh, placing them socially as to where they came from in Bengali society. Uh, mm -hmm. You talk about them being nouveau. I'm wondering, uh, did they come from uh, a specific social group that suddenly jumped in the social order because of the opportunities of the colonial structures? How did the traditional upper castes hmm. of the population and those who might have said, we might say, represented more traditional structures and culture look at them? So hmm. uh, that would be one question. The hmm. second would be, uh, you're concentrating in, in, very interesting on Bengal, and I, under, I understand this is because of the unique development of Calcutta and uh, why Bengal might stand out. But yeah. how does it compare to other areas of India? Uh, you said there are comparable uh, 
punches that are put out. Yes. In the, yes. But I assume the the older social and religious structures were different in those areas. And then mm -hmm. is Bengal unique in this and, and, and what makes it unique? Yes, yes. Yeah. So yeah, uh, both, I'll address both the questions and take it up at the same time. Uh, Bengal, first of all, because this is where the British came and settled. Okay. So uh, entire Bengal, and especially the capital Calcutta, was the hub of uh, um, trade activities and mercantile activities. Okay. And this is where the British started, right, the, the colonization from. So of course, Bengal is the hub of colonization. It starts from there. So uh, any study of um, Imperial India obviously has to begin from Bengal and the effect it had on the larger population. Now, why this particular class? Of course, as I said before, that the particular class, because they were the moneyed class, they were the rich, rich, okay, they had money. So uh, now they got into collaboration with the British when, the, when trade or banks or companies or insurance, all of this started. Okay. So because they had money and because they were rich and affluent, they could actually, they owned the land where the uh, British would set up the factory or the British uh, uh, would open a bank, whatever. So these people had to be brought into as collaborators. And that is why it began the Babu, uh, uh, the honor, the honorific title Babu was given as a respect, as regard for the money and the class and that these Bengalis be belonged to. But slowly when uh, education spread and Western influence um, happened, these, the, this class of Babus started aping uh, the Bengalis in every way. And that is where they became the butt of ridicule. So, uh, you know, they were initially collaborators. And of course, uh, later, they, as we all know, they became clerks because they came in with their smattering of English, with the little education that they had gained from the West. And these are the ones who were then uh, appointed as English, as clerks in their English companies, in the English East India Company. So uh, one is, of course, whether this was copied in other parts of India. And as I showed through the other punches, of course, there was the Avad punch, the Hindi punch, and the rest of uh, a lot of, especially in the Northern India belt, a lot of these punches were um, criticizing, caricaturing the uh, the imperial, uh, the, 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 uh, the prototype of the Englishmen that these Indians were, but it was not to that extent as it was in Calcutta. Okay, because it was in Calcutta that this educated elite Bengalis came back. This is where the hub of culture was, the hub of money was. So, uh, of course, it was happening in all over India, but especially in Bengal, especially in Calcutta. And that is why I have uh, 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 my, my study focuses on Bengal, typically. If I may uh, ask a question. Um... Um, well, I'm, um, I'm thinking over this uh, fact that uh, women were presented uh, in English, uh, in British uh, caricatures, but uh, uh, vice versa, they were not present in English caricatures. Was it because uh, uh, they were not, not that visible? Was it because they were not seen as threatening well yes. uh, but but uh, vice versa in ben yes. bengal they yes. were uh, perceived as uh, a threat to community to its integrity um, um. culture mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's a very good observation gathering i mean i never it never struck me that way but uh, thank you for pointing that out because you're very right you know it's the uh, english uh, those indian men who go to england get the English education, they come back and they start wearing those English clothes and talking with, with that English accent. So they are seen as a threat. Hmm? They're seen as people who would take the jobs, right? Uh, and of course, uh, they're seen as a threat. But women, as you're very rightly saying, were not visible. They are not a threat at all. Uh, and uh, um, it is in fact 
quite appreciated if women take up those uh, that westernized way of life, especially for the English. I'm talking of the English viewpoint, right? Is they appreciate it when women take up that Western culture because that would mean that uh, more uh, the uh, the offspring, the children, you know, would be more Anglicized. Hmm? Yeah, and it would also mean uh, um, uh, uh, it would be also advantageous for uh, proselytizing. Okay, if you have, if you know English, if you are educated in English and your English ways, then you're, you are more liable to uh, uh, convert into uh, become a Christian. Hmm? But uh, th th typically, all these things were seen as a threat by the Bengalis themselves when the women took up Western clothing, when they wore shoes. For example, wearing shoes was, of course, taken, seen as the most negative thing, right? Or covering their body hmm? and uh, and uh, uh, speaking English. Okay, so they were um, heavily criticized, satirized, because it was thought that the Bengali culture was would get defiled. Uh, so, yes, so that is why the satire on Bengali women. Yes, that they would neglect. Yeah, they would neglect their household duties, their children, right? And yes, that was how it was. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for the fascinating lecture. I I have two questions. Actually, my first question about uh, the imperial identity, the concept is from your from the title of your lecture, yeah, and one of the central. But I think. I'm a bit lacking of the context of debates about uh, the imperial identity and its limits in this 19th century Britain. Maybe you could elaborate a bit on this debate. So these people, Babu, they claimed uh, this identity yeah, to join this Britishness or Englishness, actually, was any difference between them for them. And uh, so were there any voices in Britain itself in this period who, who believed that they can be accepted or there was no debate and the race was kind of uh, impenetrable limit for this identity. Yeah? This is the first question. And the second question about this racial dimension of this satire. So as I understood, uh, you said that this racial dimension, dimension of this Satire appeared only at a certain point, 1870s, yeah, more or less. So uh, why at this time and not before? So what not, actually yes. changed in this period? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I actually didn't explain that well, uh, and that's very valid. Uh, first, because the first question that you had was that... Um, uh, you know, in, in the initial 19th century, uh, you have these great, uh, well-known names like Rabindranath Tagore, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, who went to England for education, and they brought in those Western concepts and yeah, ideas. So they were very venerated. They were very respected. Okay? And uh, so they were uh, Babu Rabindranath Tagore was the, the title that was given. Though, of course, and there were always snide remarks about how the Babu could turn into a baboon with the N at the end. Hmm? Okay, so that was always that snide ridicule, always still there. But to come to your second question, that is very relevant because why did this concept of why did this uh, no, it, why did it become a satire? Why was this honor converted into a satire later? So it was due to mainly due to the political happenings. 1857, there was a mutiny, right? There was a mutiny by the uh, by the Indians who didn't want the British to be there in India anymore. And there was uh, the entire cons uh, thing where it was it was called the first war of national independence by Indians. Of course, they were not successful, but uh, the Indians uh, did put up a huge resistance. And uh, for the first time, uh, the British became quite insecure of their uh, you know, uh, position in India. And it, it, an attempt was made, of course, and after that, uh, it became a part of the British Empire, right? After 1857, India became, it was still then under the British East India Company. It was a mercantile company. But after the uprising, after the mutiny in 1857, uh, it became a part of the British Empire. Queen Victoria became the empress of India. So once that happened, there were a lot of uh, control that was imposed on 
uh, Indians. No position of importance would be given to them. They would be just treated as clerks, interpreters, that's all. Hmm? And uh, you know, to show them their position, okay, show them their position, show them they're uncivilized, so show them that they are not fit to be compared with us. Okay, so that uh, earlier that uh, that uh, status, that respect, which was given, okay, was taken away, and it, you now they're considered the they're given the mongrel status. You are neither us nor them, right? So that sense of alienation, okay, uh, overtook most Indians at that period of time. It was primarily because of the political reason. Um. Well, I have one more question. Um, uh, I I understand that this is like completely different uh, research, but uh, uh, you are talking about um, uh, Indians, Bengalis uh, representing themselves as the subject of satire. Uh, mm. But would they dare to satirize uh, the British? Uh, well, I, I don't know how, how much satire, satire is it, but I, I'm thinking about this famous... Uh, um, a figure of tiger at attacking uh, mm -hmm. the British soldier uh, displayed in Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. was something like that present in uh, uh, Bengali Punch, or it mm -hmm. was something absolutely Im impossible? It was almost impossible. It was mm -hmm. almost impossible to have that sort of a satire, and it, uh, especially after 1857. Okay, so uh, because then this magazine would be banned. Mm -hmm. This magazine would be taken up off. Okay, so uh, and of course, um, um, in the in the in the 19th century, uh, the English were not the butt of satire. In fact, they were emulated. They were copied. They were highly like seen as the yard the, the standard right which needs to be copied so whether it be the western philosophy whether it be english education uh, whether it be their lifestyle it was considered to be uh, something very uh, upper class right it has it had to be emulated and copied and mimicked so there was no question of satire and even if they were trying to do that for example it was about the late 19th century that uh, the feeling of nationalism began Right, and the feeling of nationalism when it, that started uh, again, it was not the British as such who were being criticized. Right, it was the rule. The, no, uh, we need a self rule. That is what is being uh, emphasized. So there were many Bengali writers, well known, very well known writers, who initially began writing novels or articles or essays in English. Okay, but they immediately or slowly came back to writing in their mother tongue in Bengali because they, they realized that they can reach a larger population uh, and uh, instill this feeling of nationalism in their by through their own language and not by writing in English. Okay, yeah, so I hope I could answer. Thank you, Professor Sissin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, how much of a can, can you hear me? Yes. 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 yes, 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 yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, how much writing occurs about these issues? That is, how widely were there literary works written? Were there? Do we have a correspondence that describes the, these feelings? Uh, and in particular, I'm curious about those who are sent off to Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, uh, do we have good representations of how they feel they were received or not received? And mm -hmm. does that, to a considerable degree, then affect how they yes. act and what they do when they, they return? Hmm. Hmm. So amongst the elite intelligentsia of Bengal, there was tremendous excitement and tremendous uh, looking forward to sending their uh, sons to England, to Oxford, to Cambridge, right? They wanted to. And uh, it was a, a matter of honor if an Indian could have studied there and come back to India after completing his education in uh, England. So they were highly respected. So yeah, almost every elite Bengali household, upper class, very rich Bengali households, those who could afford it, 
tried to send their sons abroad for English education. In fact, the trend still remains, right? That sort of a trend still remains. Even if, uh, you know, most Indian households do send their sons abroad for higher education. So that was that. But uh, once they came back, uh, and uh, of course, they were the, the first reformers of the society. Okay, they uh, fought for, you know, there was this all these um, um, bad practices which were existent in the Hindu religion. They tried to reform the society. Uh, they tried to bring up the, they emancipated the uh, women, gave them, uh, the, the women were uh, encouraged to uh, get educated. So, uh, widow remarriage. Uh, banning sati or child marriage. These were some of the reforms that came into the Hindu society because these men had received their Western education, had come back and were much more liberated, much more modern in their outlook. So this was obviously very appreciated by a section of society. But then there was always a section of society who were more traditional, rigid, and orthodox, who didn't look into these things very, uh, in a, in a uh, didn't receive it well, actually. So the traditional, say, the pandits of the society didn't uh, thought this was an interference, thought that this was going against the culture. Okay? And as I just showed you some of the indigenous me methods of print, of paintings, right, by mm -hmm. the lower classes, were typically very, very, um, uh, very, uh, no, they denigrated this sort of uh, um, uh, Western educated upper class gentlemen. And they thought that this would be, uh, this would mar the culture of the society. This would destroy the culture of uh, Bengali society. So there were two sides, one which who were very appreciative, one which uh, tried to emulate and copy the British in every possible way. And there was another side uh, of the society which didn't want these changes to come. They thought that these changes would corrupt the society, would bring in bad practices. So there were both sides to it. Thank you. Um, well, if and just one more, uh, okay, and then, uh, then yes, yes, and were there other regions? Okay, then does Bengal get a specific reputation in other regions of India? I would assume there are regions where there are more traditional societies, local rulers, areas, Muslim areas, mm. uh, with Muslim rulers, and uh, does this then stamp attitude towards? what is a Bengali uh, in this uh, relationship with the imperial power? Yes. Uh, see, we have to understand it from the 19th century context when <clears throat> the concept of India itself was uh, didn't exist, right? Yeah, as a nation, it didn't exist. Okay, they were fragmented states, fragmented uh, uh, regions, uh, regions which were under local rulers, under princely states. So uh, Bengal was just one part of India. It was not even India as such. Okay? So the concept of India didn't exist at that particular time. It's much later when, when they had to, uh, when uh, it is actually the British occupation of the region that gave them the sense of unity, that they, that they started feeling that we have to throw them out. Okay, so, uh, but of course, much later, uh, the Bengalis did actually um, make a mark for themselves and for the rest of India with their education, with the, with the, with, especially with education in this field of schools, field of colleges, uh, upper, um, higher, yeah, sorry, the um, higher education. So <clears throat> the contribution of Bengal to the overall Indian culture is definitely very big. Yeah. Uh, thank you. If, if there are no more questions, I would like to uh, thank our guest, uh, Professor uh, Dutta, once again for this uh, exciting and uh, stimulating lecture, taking us away from our comfort zone and uh, uh, letting us look at these questions of uh, um, imperial rule uh, from very different perspective to, to which we are used to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you, everyone. It was, it was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you.
so now now uh, now, now we have a break till two right till till till, till four yeah <clears throat> то запрошую всіх по четвертій на круглий стіл про деколонізацію. So I invite everybody at 4 p.m. Ukrainian time for the round table about decolonizing Ukrainian status. Дякую. До зустрічі. До зустрічі, колеги. Окей. Okay.